If you're new school, this is the remix. Whatever, whatever you call it, I want to continue along the line of thinking we started last week. We started a series called Fix My Life. And I believe that there, that there is a message in the timing of this series. Prophetic implications uh, regarding what we believe God is saying to us in terms of when we're doing a series like this, which would typically for many people be done at the first of the year. But the fact that this is happening now and God is talking to us about this now, to me is an indication that there's some acceleration taking place and that, that God has given us an opportunity to do in December what some people won't do till January. He's given us a head start. Come on, I believe 2017 is going to be so amazing. He's getting us ready for it in December. Did you hear me, family? So John chapter number 2, verse number 11 is what we'll read. Verse number 11, one verse we'll read today, and uh, we'll jump right into the lesson. It says this, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. It's number one, and his disciples believed in him. This miracle revealed his glory, right? And it stimulated the faith of the disciples that they believed in him. Amen? All right, so we're talking from this subject today, running on empty. Running on empty. December, excuse me, November 27, 2016, commenced, inaugurated what is known in Christian circles as the season of Advent. Everybody say Advent. Advent. The word Advent simply means coming. Therefore, this season is a season wherein believers celebrate the coming of our Lord and our leader, Jesus Christ. And it is appropriate to celebrate his coming. It is important to celebrate his coming. Because if he didn't come down, we wouldn't be raised up. His, the coming of Christ itself is a message to the believer, assuring us that God is also Emmanuel. He is God who is with us. Christ's coming is the assurance and reassurance to all of us that whatever we are walking through, you are not walking alone. For Emmanuel is walking with you. He's not just God for you. He's God with you. He's not just the God of heaven. He's the God of the earth. He's not just God in the high places. He's God in the low places. Whatever you're walking through, even if you're like David walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you can fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. He is Emmanuel. Come on, church. He is God who is with me. He is eternally attached to me. He refuses to be separated from me. David said, I can run here and there. And he's already waiting on me before I get to where I'm going. And he still already is where I left him. He, he is God who occupies all spaces and all places at all times. He is omni present. He's where I left, where I am, and where I'm going at the same time. He eternally and simultaneously exists in three different spaces. He is, he was, and he is to come. He, he is the already and the not yet. He is God who is with us. He's in my past, making sure my past doesn't ruin my present. And he's in my present, making sure that my present doesn't ruin my future. And he's in my future, preparing a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He's God who's working in my past, working in my present, working in the future. He is Emmanuel. He is God who is with me. So when the burdens get heavy and the heart becomes filled with despair, we look in the mirror with tears rolling down our faces and we say, he is with me with my messed up self. He's with me. Oh, 
all glory to God. He's, he's with me even when I wasn't with him. He was with me. When I was faithless, he was faithful. He's been with me. He was with me when I knew he was with me. And he was with me when I didn't know he was with me. He was with me when I felt him. He was with me when I didn't. He was with me when I could see him. He was with me when I wasn't. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. So it's important, it's appropriate that we celebrate his coming. But I believe this series of teachings that we're engaged in this month pushes us a bit further and challenges us not just to celebrate that he came, but also to reflect on who came. Because just because I know his name doesn't mean I know who came. Because just because someone knows your name doesn't mean they know you. Did you hear what I'm saying? Just because someone knows your name doesn't mean they know you. It's one thing to know his name is Jesus, but it's another thing to know who the Jesus is you're talking about. Because the name Jesus is an all-encompassing name. It is a comprehensive name. It is the epitome and the compilation of all other names that were given to God in the Old Testament. It is a simplification of the complexity of the personalities of God. In the Old Testament, they had to call him Jaira. And then on one end, they had to call him Nisi. And on the other end, they had to call him Makadish. And on the other end, they had to call him Tesitkanu. On the other end, they had to call him Rapha. On the other end, they had to call him Shalom. On the other end, they had to call him Shama. But in the New Testament, he is given a name that's above all other names. And when you say Jesus, Jesus means Shalom and Rapha and Shama. He's the healer, the deliverer, the provider, the way maker. It's one thing to know his name. It's another thing to know who he is. And in this series, we are being challenged not, not just to know his name, but to know who he was and to explore an aspect of his identity that I believe is important. But because it is perceived as non-spiritual, it's often overlooked. And I want to challenge us to explore this overlooked aspect of his identity because I believe it has major implications for those of us who want God to fix our life. I want, to, I want to remind some and inform others that not only was Christ your savior, Christ was also a carpenter. And I believe <laughs> that there's a people in this room like me who not only need to be saved, but who need to be fixed. Where's my real... Where? <laughs> Yes, the Lord saved me. I know. Is there anybody here that can say, listen, the Lord saved me. I know I'm saved. I, I know I'm saved. I know I've been redeemed. That my name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. But even though I'm saved, I don't need Jesus to stop working on me because I'm saved. But I need, I need some stuff fixed. <laughs> yeah, carpentry speaks of the sanctifying work of Jesus. The sanctifying, transformative work of Jesus. That there are certain things on one end that can't be changed until other things on the other end are fixed. And one, one of the approaches that, uh, excuse me, that, that one of the things that I believe contemporary Christian churches must do when it comes to our approach to ministry is to make sure we're not trying to preach badness out of people without addressing the brokenness that produces the badness. You aren't hearing me because there's some stuff that doesn't change until other stuff gets fixed. 
and we can preach and we can pray and we can fast, but there are certain issues that flow out of some issues of brokenness on the inside of us. And until we get healed, we can't get right. And I, I, let me go over here and say it. Until some of us get healed, we can't get right. I need a carpenter. Glory to God. I need a carpenter. I need somebody to work on me. I got, got leaks in my roof and sometimes stuff on the outside get on the inside. Sometimes trouble on the outside get on the inside. I need a carpenter to fix the leaks in my roof. I, come on, somebody. Sometimes we got our foundation. It's, it's shifted and we need a carpenter to come and fix our foundation. We need a, a carpenter. It's an overlooked aspect of the work of Jesus. He's not just my savior. He's not just my deliverer. He is also my sanctifier, my carpenter. And there are a number of areas that we need the carpenter to give attention to, but this particular passage here in John 2 exposes us to an area that many of us need the carpenter to address during this Christmas Christmas and Advent season. During this Christmas and Advent season, this text exposes us to an area we need the carpenter to give attention to because during this season, many people are dealing with their wine running out. What's going on? They got a leak. Not in their house, but in their life. They're leaking wine. Pastor, what, what do you mean when you say wine? Well, the Bible is a book that is filled with metaphors and types and shadows. And sometimes we have to make sure when we're reading a biblical passage that we understand the meaning behind what we're reading. Right, so, so that we don't just get caught up in the stories of the Bible, but we actually embrace the meaning of the stories. Because the Bible's not a book of nursery rhymes where God's just attempting to reveal to us fairy tales. So when he tells us about Noah building the ark before it rains, he does not want you to get so wrapped up in the details and the specificity of whether or not a man lived with an animal for 40 days and for, with animals for 40 days and 40 nights. What he wants you to get is the meaning behind the miracle that you want to build the ark before it rains. You, you missed it. That, that, that if God puts you in an environment, because some, some of you say, I can't relate to being in an ark with created with, with creation that has a nature different than mine that's not true if you're going to work tomorrow you're working around creation you aren't talking to me that has a nature that's different than yours and God will make animals that would attack you behave come on and talk is there anybody in this room that can testify there's some people at my school, some people on my job that would love to deal with me differently, but because Emmanuel is walking with me, there's some things they would do that they can't do and they won't do. Because when I get in my ark, he'll make the animals behave. Glory to God. So it's a book of metaphors that God is, God is, I I believe in the legitimacy of scripture. I believe in the stories of scripture. I believe in them literally. However, there is a meaning behind them that should be embraced. Making sense? So when we look at wine, what does that mean? What is the message that God is trying to convey? And one of the many metaphors many metaphors associated with wine is joy. Proverbs says it makes merry. Joy. So when wine, when I say wine is leaking, I'm saying joy is leaking. (laughs) Did you hear what I said? I said, and during this season, this Christmas Advent season, for many people in America, Their joy is leaking. And in the text, Mary teaches us what to do when the wine is running out. Mary runs to Jesus. 
this is the question. Why didn't she go to the vineyard? Why didn't she send somebody to the vineyard? See, there's a message in Mary's activity. The fact that she went to Jesus is an indication of something. That there are two types of wine. There's wine you can get from the world. And then there's wine you get from Jesus. There is worldly joy. And then there's joy that comes from Jesus. You aren't hearing me. Jesus said these words to his disciples in the Gospel of John. He says, these things I've spoken to you. That my joy, come on, my joy might be in you. And that your joy might be complete. You didn't hear what I said. He said, what I want you to have is my joy. Did you hear me? My joy, meaning there's, a, there's another type of joy that comes from attainments, achievements, and acquisitions. So when you attain something, achieve something, or acquire something, it gives you a sense of joy. You obtain something, achieve something, or acquire something, it gives us a sense of joy. But this joy is temporary. This joy is elusive. This joy is fleeting. Because this joy is attached to attainment, achievement, and acquisition. So if I stop attaining, if I stop achieving, if I stop acquiring, my joy goes with it. So if you take what I acquired, you take my joy. If you take what I've achieved, you take my joy. If you take what I've attained, you take my joy. I don't want that kind of joy. I want this joy. Because this joy over here that I have, the world didn't give it to me. And the world can't take it away. This is a different type of joy that says I'm happy if you give it to me. And I'm happy if you take it. Because the good Lord gives and the good Lord takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Will I be upset if you take it? Yes. Will I get over it? Yes. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? Yeah, it's, it's, it's joy. This, 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 this joy I'm talking about is an organic, automatic outflow of a relationship with the Holy Spirit. It's what Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, he says it's fruit. It is automatic, organic outflow. If you are connected and if you are nourished, you're going to bear fruit that you don't have to produce joy. Joy will be an automatic, organic outflow if I am intimately connected with the vine. Joy just grows off of me. And when fruit's been on you on the tree long, it starts falling off. You aren't hearing what I'm saying. And that's the way joy, people will get around you and joy start falling off of you and fall, <laughs> falling on them. Joy, it's, 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 it's a sense of jubilation that's based on the revelation that my welfare and well-being rest securely in the hands of God. Joy makes a rich man jealous. Joy gives God glory, but it strengthens your witness. When we have joy, people from off the street want it. And people on Wall Street want it. <laughs> it's what you can't pay for. It's what makes Zacchaeus climb a tree and look at you and say, give me some of that. It's what makes Nicodemus come to you at night and say, I got to have some of that. It's what makes your coworkers stick their head in your office and say, do you have a second? Because they just told us they were phasing this whole department out. And everybody else is crying and having a nervous breakdown. But you sitting here packing your boxes singing, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I want to know, what is it on the inside of you that enables you to walk through fire and not be burned? And walk through the flood and not be drowned? I, I want to know what that is. It's, it strengthens your witness. It, it brings God's glory. And this is why it's so important to the enemy. And it is why he engages in all types of activity to get your joy. Because sometimes the area the enemy is busy in is not the area he's concerned about. That sometimes 
he gets in what's around us so he can poke a leak in what's in us. Sometimes he bothers what we do see to try to get to what we can't see. Oh, I got Bible. I preached the Bible. I got Bible. If we examine Job's story, we'll see the devil meddled in Job's assets, his cattle, didn't he? He meddled in Job's relationships, didn't he? His wife and his children, and he meddled in Job's health. But when you read the story, what the devil was after was not his assets. It was not his relationships, and it was not his health. What the devil was after was Job's commitment to God. The devil told God, if I take all of this, he will curse you to your face. And what made the enemy so agitated with Job is he tried all he could and still didn't get what he was after. He took his health. He took his relationships. He took his assets and he was still mad because he couldn't take his praise. Good God Almighty. And for some of you, the devil is so mad at you because he has taken everything he thought mattered to you and he still can't get the one thing he's after. And that's your commitment to God. He might be after your wine. Because the joy of the Lord, Nehemiah says, is your strength. When joy goes, strength follows. Did you hear me? When joy goes, strength follows. When the joy leaves a relationship, the desire, for, the desire to fight for it leaves also. Because who wants to fight to keep something that's killing you? The enemies after wine. Therefore, we should do all we can to make sure we steward it and protect it. And we're using this story to ask some questions of the text that can apply to our life to help us see are there areas that we can shore up to make sure we are not contributing to the leaking of our own wine. So as opposed to looking at John 2 and just focusing on the fact that Jesus had to turn water into wine, we're using this text to simply ask a question that I think is important, and that is, why did they run out in the first place? And last, last week, we gave you three potential, um, we gave you three possibilities. We said maybe it ran out because there were un uninvited guests, right? That there were some people that showed up that shouldn't have, and they should have stopped those people at the door. But when you let some stuff come too far into your life and you don't stop it at the right time, it takes your joy. Then we said there were not just uninvited guests. Number two, there were what? Unexpected guests. That some things aren't uninvited. They just showed up at a time you didn't expect. You see what I'm saying? It's like somebody shows up at your house. You're like, oh, I'm glad you came. I'm not, I'm not upset to see you. But if you called me, I would told you come at six. Right? Good people, bad timing. And sometimes stuff comes up in our life at a time we didn't expect. Is that right, family? And it can take our joy. And then thirdly, we said the inconsiderate guests. Yeah, th these, these are people who want you to be considerate of you as long as you being considerate of you doesn't negatively impact them. Right? It's people who say, get some rest until I call. <laughs> you can't help everybody, child, but me. <laughs> I, just, I just, in the few minutes I have left, want to give you three more for you to consider today. Maybe it wasn't any of the first three. Maybe it was this one. Maybe it was number one, improper planning. Maybe they sent out invitations for people. And we're expecting people to respond favorably to their invitation, but they weren't preparing for what they were expecting. Anybody expecting something? Are you preparing for it? Are you 
praying for, are you preparing for what you are praying for? Because if I don't prepare for what I pray for, I can get what I pray for, and what was intended to be a blessing becomes a burden. Whether or not the promotion is a blessing or a burden depends on if you're prepared for it. Whether or not the opportunity becomes a blessing or a burden depends on if you prepare for it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? <laughs> you see, if you really believe God's getting ready to do something unexpected in your life, are you preparing for what you're believing for? There's a story in 2 Kings chapter number 4, I believe, about a prophet named Elisha who ran into this woman who the Bible says was a well-to-do woman. And as Elijah frequented her city, she told her husband, she said, listen, let's build a room for the prophet so that whenever he comes into town, he's got a place to stay. We don't know when he's coming, but whenever he's coming, we want to have a room ready. There's no text message for him to text me when he's coming, but whenever he stops by, if the blessing is unexpected, I want to have room. You didn't hear me. And this same woman ended up losing her husband and losing her child. And the same prophet she built the room for was the prophet that showed up, laid over her child, and brought the dead thing that she birthed back to life. You missed it. Because, because I, hope no, I hope we never have to bury a child. But many of us in this room knows what it's like to bury something you gave birth to. Woo! A marriage, bury it. A business, bury it. Dreams, bury it. But the prophet laid over the thing that was dead and brought it back to life. Because she had a room that was an answer to a problem she didn't know she had yet. Because if I don't pray, prepare for what I'm praying for, if I ever get what I'm praying for, I'll get what I'm praying for. I'll get the blessing but lose the joy associated with it. If you really believe God's getting ready to do it, then get ready. Let me go on this side. No, don't just shout about it. Get, get ready. You didn't hear what I said. <laughs> Years ago, y'all, y'all don't, y'all, y'all ready to go. I'm, I'm more excited than you. This is my fourth time preaching. Now. I'm more, I said, if you really believe God's going to do what you're believing him to do, then don't just shout about it. Leave here and get ready. You aren't here. <laughs> Yeah, maybe it was improper plan. Number two, maybe it wasn't improper plan, and maybe it was inaccurate, assess, uh, inaccurate perception. Maybe, it was, maybe somebody was looking at that wine saying, oh, we got about half. We all right. When it may, maybe it wasn't a half, maybe it was a fourth. Maybe they would have stopped the wine from running out before it ran out if somebody had looked at it properly. And your joy, your wine will run out if you don't look at what you have right. You know why many people are leaking joy? Because they're not looking at what they have accurately. Don't make me run out of this chair. I felt something right there. You don't know what you have. Some people are complaining, God am I, and you have no idea what you have. Sometimes we're so focused on what we don't have that we aren't appreciative for what we do have. Are you hearing me? People may be struggling in the area of their resources and saying, I'm walking around here and I don't have any money with your full self, gas having in the car self, going back to your house self, sitting on your couch watching cable self. You're so focused, God, on what you don't have. You don't even see how blessed you are. Your full, good-looking, driving, warm house having self. Closet full of clothes I don't know what to wear. (laughs) 
When it comes to your emotions, I'm done. When it comes to your emotions, your heart follows your eyes. You hear me, family? When it comes to our emotions, our heart follows our eyes. And as long as I'm looking inaccurately at what's in my cup, no matter how much I pray, no matter how frequently I attend worship, my wine's gonna leak. Because your heart follows your eyes. It's how are you looking at it? That same prophet, Elisha, if we go down two chapters to chapter six, you'll see that there's this king that forms an alliance with other kings to attempt to take Elisha's life. And the reason they do so is because they're attempting to conquer a nation called Israel. But they can't because Elisha always gives the king prophetic insight into what's about to happen. I'm not going to bother that. This is powerful. So they are fighting with weapons. But Israel is fighting with the word. Right? Because the prophetic voice gives you an advantage. It's the X factor. And so the devil knows if I can cut you off from the voice of God, then you're left to fight the same way everybody else fights. Are you hearing me? See, you have an advantage when it comes to decision making. You look at all the facts. That's what everybody else does. But then they have to depend on their own limited intellect and ingenuity to make a decision. And they can only see in the present. But you've got a relationship with a God who can see in the future. <clears throat> Are you hearing me? So, so we don't have to suffer from the same angst and anxiety about making decisions. Why? Because I have a, a God who will speak to me beyond the realm of my five senses and say, no, leave, stay, don't do it, hold up, push back, stop, slow down, get a second opinion. Do you hear what I'm saying? If the enemy can cut us off from that, we have a weapon that we aren't using. So these kings try to come and kill Elijah. Elijah. And so the servant walks out one day and he sees all of these armies and he says, Lord, it's over. Oh, Lord. But then Elijah the prophet comes out and says, um, yeah, don't be afraid. He speaks to his fear first, don't be afraid. And then he says this, this is so powerful. This really should be an encouragement to all of you who are intercessors. Elisha prayed, open his eyes. And watch the text, then the Lord opens the servant's eyes. <laughs> you missed it. He didn't pray, Elisha didn't pray for God to open his eyes. He prayed for God to open somebody else's. And God didn't even ask the servant's permission. He opened his eyes without his permission. And when he opened his eyes, he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The servant was afraid because he wasn't seeing right. He was seeing the problem. Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes so he can see the protection. Listen to me. Look at me, everybody online. Look at me. Just because you're afraid doesn't mean you're in danger. I'm a, I'm a, did you hear? Just because you're afraid doesn't mean you're in danger. The servant was afraid, but he wasn't in danger. Because the armies of God. We're right there with him. How are you seeing it? Some stuff you can't change, but how are you seeing it? And the way you see it will determine whether or not your wine's going to run out. Last but not least, you had, what was number one? What was number two? And number three, last but not least, this is, this is important. Maybe they had unrealistic expectations. Maybe they actually thought, you were going to bring a bunch of people into a feast with a free open bar and they were just going to behave. Let me see, you mean all this wine, this, this mine? 
I don't have to pay for any of this. Your joy will run out when you have expectations of people that are not grounded in the evidence of the fruit that identifies a tree. Jesus said, you know a tree by the fruit it bears. And sometimes we're frustrated with people for not bearing fruit. They never bear. It's like being, it's like looking at a, a it's like looking at an apple tree getting mad that it's not bearing pears. And I want, you to, I want you to think about who you're frustrated with because frustration is the opposite of joy. I want you to think about who you're frustrated with and ask yourself, do you have any scriptural grounds to expect from them what you're expecting? Jesus said, you know, the tree by the fruit it bears, not a tree by its potential. It doesn't mean that you don't see the potential and encourage the potential, but people will behave according to their perception of themselves, not your perception of them. And so they don't behave in a way that's consistent with their potential until they see it. It's not enough for you to see it. They have to see it. And sometimes we're frustrated because we're expecting something from people that they've given us no reason to expect. You know what? I'm expecting him to keep his word. Why? Because he's never kept it. Y'all don't, y'all, I'm, come on now. This is, this is kingdom truth. This is, you know, I'm expecting him to keep his word. He's never kept it, but I'm expecting him to keep it. May God give us wisdom to properly plan for what we expect. May he open our eyes to properly see what's in our cup. And may God help us to adjust our expectations so that people's imperfections do not steal our joy. I want to pray for you. There are those of you in this room under the sound of my voice who need to make a decision in this. Hey, I want to thank you for watching. And I want to encourage you to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of our streams and any of our videos. All right, if this message bless you, do me a favor. Share it with somebody else. I'll see you next time.